thank you very much for <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. Kaden, for your kind introduction. Uh, this is uh, my first time to come to this gathering of uh, APA, uh, but I feel very at home uh, uh, since I enter into this room. And also, I feel very privileged to be given uh, this uh, medal. Uh, this is my first time to have um, to <laughs> to receive medal <laughs> from my school days. And the, even as the world is practically getting smaller uh, with uh, remarkable advances in transportation and communication technologies, and with all the resulting uh, increases in interaction among peoples and economies, foreign policy is unfortunately something that is all too often put on the back burner by people busy with their daily lives. Uh, this is why the activities of foreign policy association are so invaluable. Since its foundation in 1918, for nearly a century, the association has served as a catalyst for developing awareness, understanding of, and providing information, uh, informed uh, opinions on global issues. I am very much honored, therefore, this evening to receive the F uh, FPA medal, whose past uh, recipients include many people I respect uh, very much. Uh, as Mr. Caden uh, said, uh, the one of my hobby was uh, bird watching. Uh, it, to be exact, one of my hobby used to be the bird watching because uh, since I became governor uh, four years ago, I, I couldn't have time for bird watching. So <laughs> it used to be bird watching. And definitely my hobby is not central banking. <laughs> uh, today I will offer my views on the cent recent global financial crisis, which from the viewpoint of central banks was the most important international development of the past few years. In doing so, I will not comment on the crisis itself, but on the issues that the crisis has raised concerning the role of central banks. As the crisis is bound to leave indelible marks on the global economy, uh, it would probably affect how central banks would conduct uh, their business in the future. In this crisis, as I will later explain, central banks have succeeded in deflecting the destructive forces in the acute phase by injecting unprecedented amount of liquidity into financial system and by rolling out massive monetary easing. Now, the crisis has moved into the chronic phase characterized by low growth and persistent unemployment. In this regard, many more challenges certainly lie ahead before we can even task take back the lost ground and make further advances from there. One reminder that uh, prosperity is quite fragile can be found in the economic consequences of the peace by John Maynard Keynes. I believe it is rather fitting to quote his writing today considering that Foreign Policy Association was founded to promote the just peace advocated by President Wilson, who led the U.S. delegation to Versailles, and that the collective failure of the international community to achieve that goal at Versailles prompted Lord Keynes to write the book. Lord Keynes described the world before the First World, uh, the first world as an uh, economic Eldorado or economic utopia, where a middle class Londoner could easily order by telephone the various products of the four earth and adventure his wealth in any quarter of the world. Furthermore, this state of affairs was regarded as normal, certain, and permanent, except in the direction of 
further improvement. Whenever I read this passage, I'm always struck by the power of globalization in bringing about economic prosperity, the ephemeral quality of such achievement in the light of the two world wars, and parallel with our experience leading to great financial crisis. In our current discourse on economic policy, or more broadly, the whole economy, no one would doubt the critical stabilizing role played by central banks. Nevertheless, economic history after the Second World War re revealed that such a view is quite a recent product. The enhanced role of central banks came into being on the back of three important challenges, uh, changes. Firstly, there is now a clear division of labor between monetary and fiscal policies. To our eyes, such an arrangement seems too obvious, but during the war in many countries, including the United States and Japan, monetary policy was subordinated to fiscal policy. In fact, monetary policy continued to be constrained for some time after the war. For example, in the United States, the Fed was freed in 1951 from the obligation to maintain long-term interest rate below a level set by the Treasury. After arriving at the so-called accord between the Treasury and the Fed. Secondly, there is no longer any doubt about the role of monetary policy. It is widely accepted that monetary policy should be an important stabilizing force for the macro economy. During the 1960s and as late as the first half of 1970s, an influential school of thought now more or less discredited held that a slightly higher inflation was a necessary evil for achieving stronger growth and fuller employment. As market conditions were relaxed and tightened uh, discretionarily, with such a bias over a number of business cycles, inflation began to creep up quite noticeably. It became evident that higher inflation was not contributing to higher growth or employment. Furthermore, the distortions in saving and investment decisions of economic agents and in resource allocation resulting from higher inflation became a drag on growth. This was how stagflation of late 1970s came into being. This unpleasant experience taught us that economic growth could only be sub sustained with a price stability, and price stability should be the goal of monetary policy. Finally, against the backdrop of the first two changes, central banks are nowadays granted formal independence. If central banks are to pursue price stability, they should be able to conduct monetary policy from a medium to long-term perspective away from short-term concerns. This is legally secured by recognizing the independence of central banks in national laws. Looking back, there were not many central banks that had statutory independence in the 1980s. The situation changed markedly during the 1990s when many countries, including Japan, revised their central bank laws. The new, laws clarified, the new law clearly stipulated the independence of the central bank in conducting monetary policy. These changes were the basis of the new institutional framework for the conduct of monetary policy, which emerged from second half of 1980s and into 1990s. At the core of the new framework was a linkage between independence and mandate to ensure price stability. In other words, central banks are held strongly accountable for achieving price stability in return for being granted independence. In the context of this transformation, 
there was also <coughs> a slight shift in the traditional mandate granted to central banks regarding the regulation and supervision of financial institutions. Under the view that price stability and financial stability are two distinct objectives, and in order to avoid concentrating too much power in one institution, at some central banks, for example, at the Bank of England, regulatory and supervisory functions were carved out and transferred to another organization, thereby letting central banks to focus solely on monetary policy. As this new framework of monetary policy was being accepted over the 1990s, many developed economists experienced a prolonged period of both relatively high growth and stable prices. The age of great moderation had come. The phrase quickly gained popularity, capturing the optimistic mood of the time. And central banks were praised for their substantial role in bringing about prosperity. In a sense, the 1990s and 2000, up until the crisis, were in fact the heyday of central banking. One exception, however, was the Japan. Actually, Japan was experiencing profound change in the economy ahead of other developed economies. While Japan had suffered severe stagflation at the time of the first oil shock, first oil shock of the 1970s, its subsequent economic performance was superior compared with other developed economies. The bubble years of the second half of 1980s were, in this vein, the culmination of all, all that was good about Japanese economy. The bubble burst in the 1990s, and Japan has since been suffering from its lingering effects. It is quite remarkable that economies in North America and Europe are now experiencing the same changes that Japan had ex has experienced from the 1990s onwards. Since 2006, the United States has experienced a drawn out period of declining house prices. This was only the beginning. Financial, strain, financial strains quickly spread around the world engulfing many venerable names, both in the United States and Europe, and leading up to, but not ending with the demise of Lehman Brothers. As government and central banks intervened aggressively, the global financial system and economy subsequently gained a <coughs> respite, but it was short life. Beginning from the spring of 2010, cascading problem within the euro area weighed on global economic activity and heightened uncertainties. Consequently, output in the developed economies is only 4% above the pre-crisis P, and average growth since 2007 is poultry 0.8%. What went wrong? What can central banks do to prevent the development of another disruptive bubble. Policy makers are certainly in the middle of soul searching regarding the conduct of monetary policy and the regulation and supervision of financial institutions in the years leading to and during the crisis. Today, I will just stress one point. The key issue is that price stability and financial stability are in <coughs> intricately intertwined. In an environment of price stability, economic agents may come to expect ever more strongly that a prolonged period of low interest rate would be sustained. This could exacerbate financial imbalances, such as increasing asset prices or leverage. Taken too far, such imbalances would destabilizing, destabilize the financial system, which would then lead to an acceptably large fluctuation of real economic activity, 
and ultimately prices. In this vein, monetary policy must take account not only of inflation, but also of financial imbalances. And it must attempt to look beyond the conventionally accepted time horizon. At the same time, it has also become clear that it is not appropriate to purge non-monetary policy function from central banks, and that central banks must maintain at least some regulatory and supervisory functions over financial institutions. Apart from these somewhat abstract challenges of tomorrow, today, central banks are still confronted with numerous challenges resulting from the recent global economic and financial turmoil. What can central banks do in this difficult environment? The answers are inevitably unique to each central bank, but let me identify some common emerging themes. Currently, many central banks are implementing measures that were unthinkable only a few years ago. As interest rates are cut to almost zero, there is no longer any room for conducting monetary policy in the traditional sense. Consequently, central banks are now conducting so-called unconventional monetary policy. This fact is reflected in the most significant in increases in the size of central bank balance sheets. The composition of balance sheet has also changed considerably. In the case of the Bank of Japan, over the last 10 years, it has purchased various risk assets, such as corporate bonds, equities, and exchange-traded funds. Looking at the Fed, it has purchased various risk assets, such as mortgage-backed securities. Meanwhile, the European Central Banks supplied an un unlimited amount of three-year loan to banks. Furthermore, on interest rate development, the Bank of Japan has made clear its commitment and the Fed anna has announced its guidance. Unfortunately, notwithstanding this effort, growth in the developed economy remain anemic, as I noted a few minutes ago. When conducting monetary policy in such an environment, central banks must be aware of three socioeconomic trends. Firstly, in many developed economies, there are heightened expectations on what central bank could deliver. In this regard, one of the most symbolic discussions touch upon the measures that could be unleashed by the ECB in the context of euro area financial crisis. Some have forcefully argued for increasing the bank's supply of liquidity through a novel and untested function, a lender of last resort to governments rather than private institutions, private financial institutions. There are probably several reasons for the elevated, elevated uh, expectation. Probably the most important one is the prolonged period of low growth and high unemployment. Another factor is the increasing constraint on the conduct of fiscal policy, re reflecting the dire straits of government finances in most developed economies. Furthermore, one could also point out that central banks can put up a huge wall of money almost instantaneously. This could be most relevant given the difference in the speed demanded by the market for results and the amount of time that is necessary for the democratic process to agree on and implement fiscal and structural policies. However, one interpret what is happening now, there is a potentially toxic mix of heightened expectation regarding central banks on the one hand and what central bank could actually deliver on the other. If central banks cannot deliver, public confidence in the institution will be eroded. This, to which I will come back later, will impact the efficacy of central bank's policy. Turning to the second issue, I would like to draw your attention to the blurring of the line between 
monetary and fiscal policies. Unconventional monetary policy of central banks involves the purchases of substantial amounts of long-term government bonds and or risk asset. The value of these assets in the long run may fall, and when that happens, losses incurred by central banks will have to be passed on to taxpayer in the form of reduced profit, uh, profit distribution from central bank to the government. Additionally, these purchases will inevitably influence micro-level resource allocation. In this respect, unconventional monetary policy is getting closer to fiscal policy. Considering that in a democracy, the delegation of power to issue unlimited amount of legal tender to an independent central bank can only be justified by the tacit understanding that it will not overstep into the realm of fiscal policy. The adoption of measures bordering on fiscal policy could ultimately undermine the legitimacy of central bank independence and public trust in the institutions. The third and final issue is a corollary to the first two issues, reflecting the fact that central banks are introducing the heretofore untested measures. Public opinion is beginning to diverge widely on the desirable course of action by central banks. One example is a policy proposal for ECB that I have noted a few minutes ago. In the United States, monetary, policy, monetary easing by the Fed is criticized by those who fear the consequence of inflation, while there are many economists who believe additional easing is warranted in view of the slightly falling but still stubbornly high unemployment. Also in Japan, there is a heated discussion on monetary policy and fiscal consolidation. Up till now, uh, I have explained the significant economic and social changes evident in the operating environment for central banks. The role of central banks needs to be carefully deliberated in the context of these changes. If I may jump to the conclusion first, it is dangerous to both over and underestimate what central banks could achieve. Central banks must act correctly. One thing that central bank can always do is to stamp out inflation. No matter how severe inflation is, conceptually, it can be contained by monetary tightening. Nevertheless, it should also be noted that conceptual possibility and practicality is not the same. Statutory independence is not sufficient. Central banks should not waver in the face of unpopularity, and society at large must be ready to uh, acquiesce. Another important thing that central bank can achieve is to prevent the meltdown of financial system through its land of last resort function to banks. This is the most important role in view of preventing the economy from falling into severe deflation. Reflecting on the Japan's financial crisis of the late 1990s and the recent financial crisis, missteps in policy could have resulted in a much worse over outcome, perhaps akin to the Great Depression of 1930s. The most important uh, differences was that central banks acted as a lender of last resort. Shocks could be dampened through central banks' action that mitigated the loss of trust among private economic agents. Furthermore, in a crisis environment, it also becomes imperative to maintain the efficient and uninterrupted functioning of the system, an arrangement through which money and other financial instruments flow. Central banks have, over the last two decades, made various efforts to improve <coughs> its resilience for example, introducing the simultaneous settlement of foreign exchange claims. Such exercises are not glamorous, but probably contributed considerably in preventing chaos after the recent 
recent collapse of Lehman Brothers. While central banks can, can achieve a lot, we should not have the illusion that there are no limits to the power of a central bank. Central bank cannot reasonably deliver solution to the structural issues. Let me take the current problem in the euro area as an example. The situation in the euro area significantly deteriorated since the summer of last year. The fire sales in government bond market of the so-called peripheral countries led to vicious cycle of worsening fiscal balance, increasing tension in the domestic banking system, and the dampening of real economic activity. With a view to arresting and hopefully reversing this disruptive momentum, European Central Bank has supplied unlimited amount of three-year funds. The subsequent return of relative calm to global financial markets demonstrate that central bank liquidity can play an important role. At the same time, it must also be impressed that liquidity provision has only bought time. One must not lose sight of the fundamental issues, one of which is current account imbalances within euro area. When the euro was introduced in 1999, interest rate for all member economies converged on one low level. This led to great expansion in the periphery, which at the same time lost competitiveness because of the increase in wage and prices. Now, policy must be put in place to achieve the root cause of the problem. Structural problem must be implemented. A structural reform must be implemented within the breathing space provided by the provision of central bank liquidity. If complacency set in because of the improvement in market sentiment, uh, we could be headed, to for, headed for a worse outcome. Time both can equally be usefully spent or wasted. Structural issues are everywhere in the developed economies. Japan is no exception. The Japanese economy has stagnated and the rate of growth is subpar among the major economies. Given that power worker growth is a, uh, given uh, that growth rate per worker uh, is the highest among its peers, the challenges facing Japan is adapting to the rapidly changing demography, which no other country has so far experienced. The low aggregate growth and the huge fiscal holes are both largely the symptoms of the failure to adapt to the demographic reality. The modest deflation is in turn largely attributable to the lower growth outlook, impacting expected future incomes, income and hence current spending. In this sense, if Japanese economy is to extricate itself from deflation and return to a path of sustainable growth under price stability, it requires both policies aimed at enhancing growth potential and supporting monetary stimuli. On the part of the Bank of Japan, we are fully committed to continuing powerful monetary easing through various measures, including maintaining the policy interest rate at practically zero and purchasing financial asset until the current goal of year on year CPI inflation at 1% is deemed to be achievable. The ultimate objective for central banks is to realize stable and sustainable growth. Operationally, this is going to be achieved through the stability of prices and the financial system. Having said that, it must also be said that this goal is not pursued in a vacuum. Uh, such growth can only materialize through the intricate interaction among various economic agents. While the central bank is probably the actor most responsible for ensuring price stability in a steadily expanding economy, some condition must be met before the central bank could make the most of its potential. 
those conditions have not always been appreciated, but our experience after the recent global financial turmoil have brought them back in focus. The first condition is ensuring the sustainability of public finances. When doubts arise over fiscal sustainability, serious efforts, serious efforts are required to regain confidence. If this is unsuccessful, the only plausible available options are either inflation or outright default. The operational objective of the central bank price stability in the first instance and the financial stability in the second will be compromised, will be compromised with dire consequences for economic activity and the welfare of the people. In this sense, the sustainability of public finances is an essential condition for central bank to realize its ultimate objective. The second condition is maintaining the credibility of central bank among the general public. Economic agents can be savers or borrowers, exporters or importers. And while some may benefit from the action of the central bank, others may lose out. As a result, it is most important that general public truly believe that central bank is acting to maximize the medium to long-term potential of the full economy. The effectiveness of measures heavily depends on expectation formed against the background of credibility. The time-honored reluctance of central banks to enter into quasi-fiscal measures is based on deference of the neutrality, which is crucial for maintaining independence. In this context, the unconventional policy currently implemented by central banks of the major developed economies will truly be tested when central banks deem that policy are no longer necessary. The appropriateness of policy will inevitably be judged by how quickly and smoothly such policy could be unwound. While central banks must be bold in times of crisis, they need to be most vigilant at the same time. The third condition is upholding the public support for the market economy. While this goes beyond central bank policy, it is most relevant because all, of, all the policies adopted by central bank presuppose the existence of competitive market economy. Such support can easily be eroded when the public at large comes to believe that the decks are stacked against them. The increase in un un unemployment rate, unemployment following the recent financial crisis, the widening of the wage gap between skilled and unskilled workers, and antipathy against banks and bankers rescued by taxpayer money could all result in the weakening of support for competitive market economy. In the long run, this could pave the way for the adoption of policies that are detrimental to the efficient functioning of the economy. One of the lessons learned from the interwar years in the first half of the 20th century was that crisis response begets the next crisis, and then epitomized the spread of protectionism and the beggar thy neighbor competitive devaluation. Policymakers must not forget such lessons of history. Uh, in his recent book, Finance and the Good Society, the influential author, uh, Robert Shira at Yale University, notes that central banks are an invention that served its purpose at a certain time in history, in a certain kind of environment, and goes on to say that the time may have passed. Central banks could not prevent the bubble and following crisis. Nevertheless, as I have explained today, the role of central banks has evolved over the years, and that process is continuing or has even accelerated after the great financial crisis. Our economic system, while bringing us unprecedented prosperity, is an inherently unstable creature because of its dynamism. 
if the people of the world are to maintain, let alone further improve, their current lifestyle, policy makers must not let the various currents unleashed by crisis threaten the foundation on an affluent society. In an ideal world, if we could understand and model why you decided to have, uh, have a latte instead of espresso this morning, uh, it could be possible to design an automatic stabilizing mechanism for the economy. And central banks would become only a chapter in economic history book. Nevertheless, being, uh, being a complex system that involves people and their emotions, managing the economy will probably remain an art rather than a science, where human actors who can learn from the past and adapt accordingly have to play a leading role. Automatic stabilizers and mechanical rules will not work. Continuing this process of learning and adapting, I believe, is at the core of the challenges facing central bank at this juncture. And if central banks can meet these challenges, central bank will still be able to fully serve the good society. Thank you very much. Governor Shirakawa, thank you very much for those insightful remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, we stand adjourned.